Well, good morning, everyone. And if I could uh, welcome everyone to George Washington University, to the Homeland Security Policy Institute. Um, let me also welcome our viewers watching on C-SPAN. And let me also welcome our speaker today back home. Uh, as many of you know, Brian Kamoy has a uh, strong George Washington University connection. Uh, the topic for today's discussion is Presidential Policy Directive 8, or the National Preparedness Directive, a directive that has been a long time coming, I think it's fair to say, uh, especially as many in this room have been working on uh, Homeland Security Policy Directive Number 8 for a number of years, and I couldn't think of a more significant or important directive. Uh, than preparing our country for all sorts of threats, ranging from terrorism to cyber attacks to pandemics to catastrophic uh, natural disasters, uh, uh, which is obviously very timely given the events uh, in Tokyo and the tragedy in, in Japan uh, that we're seeing unfold now. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, before introducing Brian, uh, a task force we stood up on resilience. This is an issue that has been uh, something that our institute is focused on for a long time. Um, and earlier this year, we stood up a task force chaired by Dave Paulison, Mike Balboni, and my deputy here, Dan Kanuski. Um, and I'd like to thank ICF for their contributions uh, to, to assure the, that we can do the hard work and the heavy lift uh, that, that goes into that task force. But the purpose for today is to, to hear from Brian Kamoy. And Brian, I've known for a number of years I think I first met him, and probably uh, on certain occasions he curses me out, because uh, probably about six years ago, I think I uh, was asked by HHS, including uh, by someone who's in the room here today, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary at Health and Human Services, who's the best talent you have at GW who might uh, want to play a role uh, in government and, and serve their country. And at that time, I put together, I put forward a couple of names. One of those was Brian. And uh, uh, as you can see, he has continued to move up and up and up and up the ranks. Um, he served as a Deputy Assistant Secretary at Health and Human Services. Um, and it's kind of interesting, given now that he oversees uh, some of these presidential directives from a White House perspective, he saw it from both perspectives. At the time, he was uh, looking at it from a departmental level uh, as well. So, um, uh, and before and after uh, leaving HHS, he's now the Senior Director for, for Preparedness at the National Security Staff at the White House. And uh, it, uh, I think it's going to be publicly announced today at noon, or publicly released today at noon, the uh, Later policy directive. But it's here in hard copy. And for those of you who are here, you have a hard copy. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Brian, and Dan Kanuski will moderate the session, given... Uh, his historical role on all of these issues, including in the previous administration, uh, the same uh, that I served in. So, Brian, thank you for joining us, and uh, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Good morning. We can do better than that. Good morning. There you go. I know it's Friday. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, Frank, thank you. Dan. Uh, the entire Homeland Security Policy Institute team, uh, and the George Washington University. Uh, I don't curse you, Frank. I thank you uh, for the opportunity uh, seven years ago, uh, February 1. Um, but what Frank won't tell you about that story is that I did go on loan uh, from the George Washington University faculty to HHS for a year. That should tell you seven years later, uh, I'm not very good at following instructions. Uh, but thank you for... Uh, that opportunity then and for Bob Blitzer uh, at HHS. Uh, but I am thrilled to have this discussion at GW. As Frank mentioned, I've got a long and, uh, from my perspective, very productive relationship uh, with the university. I should warn you, however, that there is a group of graduate students directly across the hall uh, participating in what they describe to me as a very serious exercise uh, involving uh, foreign relations and the use of force. Uh, so if they come and remove me from the podium, uh, I'll trust it's part of their game uh, and not something I've said to you. <laughs> On a more serious note, uh, the reason we're here, uh, the president's highest priority is the safety and security of the American people. He's committed to securing the homeland against 21st century threats by preventing terrorist attacks, preparing for emergencies regardless of their cause, 
and investing in strong response and recovery capabilities. We aim to prevent what we can and respond rapidly to what we must. In support of that commitment, last week President Obama signed a new presidential policy directive on national preparedness, PPD-8. The directive outlines the President's vision for strengthening the security and the resilience of our nation through systematic preparation for threats to our security, including acts of terrorism, pandemics, significant accidents, and catastrophic natural disasters. What I would like to do this morning is to outline our approach to preparedness, tell you more about the directive and what departments and agencies are already doing uh, to uh, move out and embody its principles, and leave time for some discussion. I brought copies of the PPD uh, in hard copy for those of you here this morning, uh, and the directive will be posted later today uh, to the websites of the Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Our approach to preparedness, which is reflected in the PPD, rests on three key principles. First, we're focused on an all-of-nation approach aimed at enhancing integration of effort across federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial governments, closer collaboration with the private and nonprofit sectors, and more engagement of individuals, families, and communities. As we've seen during countless incidents, which have informed our development uh, of the directive, from the 2009 H1N1 pandemic to the response to the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill, our national response is strengthened when we leverage the expertise and resources that exist in our communities. All of us can contribute to safeguarding our nation from harm, and we must continue to lean forward together to prepare for all hazards. And you've seen this principle already. It's reflected in the Department of Homeland Security's Quadrennial Homeland Security Review. It appears as a cornerstone of our approach to health security reflected in the National Health Security Strategy of the Department of Health and Human Services. And you can see it and hear it in the approach of FEMA Administrator Craig Fugate, who talks about those who have suffered disasters not as victims, but as survivors who can help the community respond and recover. Craig has initiated a whole of community planning effort that recognizes communities are inherently strong and resilient, even in the face of disasters. This approach relies on understanding and meeting the true needs of the entire affected community, engaging all aspects of that community, the private, the nonprofit, the public sectors, in both defining those needs and devising ways to meet them, and strengthening the assets institutions, and social processes that work well in communities on a daily basis to improve resilience and emergency management outcomes. You can also see it in Craig's rotation program that brings private sector representatives into the FEMA Operations Center so that the government can learn from and leverage the private sector's expertise, avoid trying to recreate functions that the private sector does well every day, and learn how and where public-private efforts are best applied during emergencies. And you can also see all of government approaches to identify over the horizon and short-term threats. The U.S. government continually detects, assesses, and preempts terrorist threats. The National Counterterrorism Center brings together the entire intelligence community to review and prioritize these threats into the daily threat matrix. So across the federal family, the focus has turned outward to how we integrate our efforts with one another and how we integrate better with the communities we all serve. Second, we seek to build the key capabilities we would need to confront any challenge. Capabilities defined by specific and measurable objectives are the cornerstone of preparedness. Rather than rigid approaches that apply only in certain scenarios if specific assumptions come true, a focus on capabilities will enable integrated, flexible, 
and agile all hazards efforts tailored to what we know are unique circumstances of any given threat, hazard, or actual event. For example, building flexible capabilities such as search and rescue and medical surge enable the response to a wide range of incidents, regardless of their cause. And so FEMA's whole of community catastrophic planning effort demonstrates this approach. Known as the maximum of maximums, the focus is on planning around a catastrophe and 13 core capabilities where extraordinary, extraordinary levels of mass casualty, damage, and disruption overwhelm our traditional plans and processes. This effort is a concrete step in making the all of nation, whole of community principle real in operations. Another example comes from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Just a few weeks ago, the CDC released 15 capabilities to serve as national public health preparedness standards to assist state and local public health departments with their strategic planning. Third, we are actively pursuing more rigorous assessment systems that are focused on outcomes so that we can measure and track our progress over time. We simply need to do better in articulating our current level of preparedness and demonstrating what innovations have worked. FEMA and HHS are very actively evaluating their grant programs, aligning them around the outcomes to be achieved, and seeking to clarify program guidance so that we have even better data to answer key questions such as, are we prepared? How would we know? And how better are we this year than last? And so consistent with these principles, we undertook a comprehensive review of our national preparedness policy. As part of that review, we spoke with 24 national associations that represent a wide range of stakeholders, including a variety of disciplines, law enforcement, public health, emergency medical services, emergency management, the National Guard. And I'm pleased to see that a number of representatives from those organizations are with us this morning. And we also evaluated our preparedness policy in light of the requirements of the Post-Katrina Emergency Management Reform Act of 2006. The result of that review is the policy we announced today, which replace, replaces Homeland Security Presidential Directive 8 of 2003 uh, and its Annex 1 of 2007, but for a few minor exceptions that are noted uh, in the new Presidential Policy Directive, or PPD. The directive calls for the establishment of a an overarching national preparedness goal that identifies the core capabilities necessary for the spectrum of preparedness, which encompasses five broad mission areas. Prevention, those capabilities necessary to avoid, prevent, or stop a threatened or actual act of terrorism. Protection, those capabilities necessary to secure the homeland against acts of terrorism and man-made or natural disasters. Mitigation, those capabilities necessary to reduce loss of life and property by taking steps to lessen the impact of disasters. Response, the capabilities necessary to save lives, protect property and the environment, and meet basic human needs after an incident occurs. And recovery, those capabilities necessary to assist communities affected uh, by the incident to recover. And these capabilities will be defined in terms of risk and objectives. First, the risk of specific threats and vulnerabilities, which we'll aim to define using objective risk factors, who needs a capability, where, and how much that capability is needed, and why and concrete, measurable, and prioritized objectives to define what needs doing, how much, how fast, and for how long, based on a critical few specific performance objectives that will define each capability. The directive also calls for the development of a national preparedness system to guide activities that will enable the nation to meet the national preparedness goal. The specific planning, organization, equipment, training and exercises 
needed to build and maintain domestic capabilities, what you all recognize as the preparedness cycle of effort. And with respect to capabilities, we heard clear feedback from our stakeholders. One size does not fit all, and communities have differing needs based on the risks they face. That said, we believe it important to come to agreement on a few critical few priority capabilities that most communities will share. For example, medical surge, uh, information sharing, so that communities can concentrate on what they realistically need instead of a one-size-fits-all approach or a one-size-fits-none approach. This focus on capabilities will also drive the evolution of our planning efforts, which will seek to identify how we can most effectively mix and match our capabilities where needed to be the most agile and flexible in our approach. And so the PPD requires capabilities-based planning frameworks across the five mission areas I mentioned. Prevent, protect, respond, recover, and mitigate. As you know, we have a national response framework, uh, which is currently in the process for review and revision. The National Disaster Recovery Framework uh, is a requirement uh, already provided in statute. And thus, the frameworks for prevention, protection, and mitigation will similarly galvanize planning around the key capabilities necessary for those activities. That said, the intent is not to produce unwieldy and long documents that merely take up space on our shelves. Our stakeholders were also quite clear on the need to streamline and rationalize all of the guidance documents and plans. Because we recognize, and at the local level especially, that the same person who has to develop the plans the documents and the grant application packages that we call for is the same person who has to respond to the next fire or the next heart attack. And so we want to move away from overly burdensome requirements. And thus we will aim to continually streamline and simplify. There are many federal departments and agencies that support activities across the national preparedness spectrum. And the PPD specifies a number of roles and responsibilities. Notably, the Department of Homeland Security will undertake the interagency efforts to develop the National Preparedness Goal, System, and Annual Report. These are multidisciplinary efforts by design and will involve many departments and agencies. We've also, in the PPD and otherwise, placed a renewed emphasis on individual and community preparedness, which we believe is a cornerstone of our national resilience. The public plays a critical role on our nation's emergency management team in every type of incident. And our goal is to empower Americans with the information about the risks we face and the actions we can all take to protect ourselves and our communities. For example, during the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, the CDC communicated clear messages to the American people about what they could do to prevent the spread of disease. And you probably all know this instinctively now. Cover your cough, stay home if sick, keep sick children out of school. And so we're very confident in the American people when provided the information about the risks they face and what they can do about it. Uh, will uh, take appropriate action. FEMA's Ready campaign at ready.gov provides simple and practical steps all Americans can take to become better prepared, including how to prepare a family emergency plan, an emergency supply kit, and how to get involved in community preparedness efforts. Given your expertise and your interest uh, in this morning's topic, I'm also confident you are probably among the most prepared audiences I could imagine, but I would be remiss if I did not mention the basics even here. Our challenge continues to be making more effective use of the resources we have in our communities and at all levels of government. And it's no surprise to you that yes, our resources are constrained. Our thinking need not be. 
so that we measure and track our preparedness efforts over time based on the key outcome measures I've talked about and communicate our level of preparedness to the Congress and to the American people. The directive requires the preparation of a national preparedness report every year. A clear, articula our clear articulation uh, on the return we receive for investments in preparedness is even more critical in the current fiscal environment. The good news is that the nation is better prepared to navigate a catastrophic incident than ever before. This is true first and foremost because of the ongoing integration of efforts across all levels of government, but also because of the active engagement of the private sector, the nonprofit sector, and individuals and communities. PPD-8 aims to enhance further this integration of efforts. By actively breaking down barriers between levels and layers of government, we are more agile and better able to mix and match respective capabilities to confront unique circumstances. For example, DHS, HHS, and the Department of Defense are leading the implementation of the President's Executive Order 13527 to establish capabilities to dispense medical countermeasures during a large-scale biological attack. Those departments have broken down barriers, and for the first time, we've seen HHS and CDC, FEMA, and DOD planners working alongside not just one another, but with state and local public health and emergency managers to solve what we know are some very serious, challenging requirements of rapid distribution of medical countermeasures that would be necessary to save lives. In addition, as we saw during the earthquake in Haiti and are seeing in the current response to events in Japan, many departments and agencies from state and USAID, uh, HHS, DOD, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Department of Energy, are enhancing international cooperation and collaboration on the ground through active disaster management assistance. We will study every aspect of the response in Japan so that we can learn lessons from the unprecedented earthquake, tsunamis, and nuclear emergency. Beyond the PPD itself, we are seeking to be smarter in our approach by identifying rate limiting steps and planning accordingly, reducing decision points before disaster strikes, reducing points of failure through plan simplification, developing emergency action documents to enable life-saving actions and authorities to optimize speed, focusing on the outcome up front, and establishing well-understood protocols for communication and coordination, and then practicing them through exercises, such as the upcoming National Level Exercise, or NLE 2011, which next month will simulate the catastrophic nature of a major earthquake in the central United States region of the new Madrid seismic zone, which includes eight states. While all disasters are unique, there are things that we can and are doing every day to assist in better navigating whatever catastrophe might occur. The President's new policy on national preparedness aims to enhance these efforts. I want to thank you for your time and attention this morning and your interest in our national preparedness and I very much look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. That was a great overview of the uh, directive and also of preparedness in general. Something I think everybody in this room really believes in. I see a lot of my former colleagues from the Bush administration here, as well as new colleagues from the Obama administration. And I think preparedness, and Homeland Security probably in general is one of those bipartisan issues that's actually out there today. So, Brian, I can't think of a, a better um, sign of bipartisanship than you occupying my former office at the White House. So I'm pleased to have you there. We, we still have a few things you left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brian, on, on a serious note, uh, resilience. That's a word that our task force that uh, we had talked about a little bit at the beginning is focused on because – Resilience seems to be one of those words out there. I don't want to call it a buzzword, but it's certainly a word that we affix to a lot of different issues. And if, if you could provide us uh, a better understanding of what resilience means to you and to the Obama administration and how that really interacts with what you just discussed, 
with PPD-8, I think that would be actually a very useful way to start this conversation. Uh, I'd be glad to, and it's a very useful question. Thanks, Dan. When the President integrated the staffs of the National Security Council and the Homeland Security Council following Presidential Study Directive Number 1, uh, he created a Resilience Directorate. Uh, which spans the full range of uh, preparedness through uh, response activities. And we decided very early on uh, that we need to approach um, the term in a way that was um, easily understood by many different disciplines. And so we did a little research uh, based on the research skills I learned here at GW uh, and found very quickly that some two dozen disciplines use the term resilience, from systems engineers to um, uh, folks who work in the environment and ecology. And what became clear pretty quickly is that it was not going to be fruitful to spend six or eight months arguing about the precise 38 words that would be in one single definition of resilience, but that rather we would focus on a few key principles of resilience that we thought all of the activities and everyone who was trying to advance them could see themselves in. And so as applied to this discipline, those principles included withstanding. We have to be able to withstand an incident, adapting, adapt to change because incidents bring us different circumstances and then rapidly recover. And so those three principles, withstand, adapt, rapidly recover, uh, became the organizing principles around our resilience activities. And so we think that owners and operators of critical infrastructure can see themselves in that. Their facilities need to be able to withstand disruption, need to be able to rapidly recover, adapt to change. Uh, we believe that applies at the individual and family level uh, to be able to withstand, uh, ideally built upon some preparedness steps you have taken. Uh, and so you'll see these principles articulated in the national security strategy where resilience has become a, uh, an imperative to guide our work. Uh, the principle is uh, featured in the Quadrennial Homeland Security Review um, but all of these programmatic efforts to support those principles, uh, we've gone beyond the notion of the definition alone and gone beyond um, any notion that it's simply a buzzword, uh, but that we believe these efforts will enhance not just our security but our resilience as a nation, will leverage the strength and inherent resilience of the American people who can withstand disruption, who can adapt to change, and who can rapidly recover. I think let's now drill down on a specific situation that, um, frankly, the world is facing. Uh, questions have been raised here domestically, and that's nuclear preparedness. So we're all very familiar with the, the disaster in Japan. And many of us are asking now, how well prepared are we here in the United States? And as recently as today in the Washington Post, there's a story calling that into qu question, specifically with healthcare uh, facilities. So, Brian, could you address uh, nuclear preparedness sure. uh, specifically? Well, as I mentioned in the, in the remarks, we're taking and will take a very close look at the response in Japan so that we can learn the lessons there. We've done a number of uh, initiatives and efforts to aggressively prepare this nation for uh, radiation emergencies of any type, uh, because as you know, uh, we could experience a radiological emergency from a nuclear power plant, from an improvised nuclear device, uh, or a radiological dispersal device. But I'll just highlight a few of those efforts. Uh, in June of last year, uh, we issued the second edition of planning guidance to uh, state and local colleagues for um, preparedness for an improvised nuclear device which includes planning considerations for sheltering in place, for evacuation, uh, and for communicating with the public uh, ahead of these kinds of events. As you know, the key message to uh, community in any kind of incident would be the same, and that is follow the instructions of your 
uh, local emergency management and your local leaders uh, who obviously have the best uh, information about what's happening on the ground. Uh, but we think it very important to communicate with the American people ahead of these kinds of events. And it's the second edition because it takes into account uh, the latest in scientific uh, evidence uh, from a number of studies that the Department of Homeland Security and other uh, aspects of the U.S. government have funded uh, to understand better uh, what the threat is and what actions uh, would be most helpful. Because the guidance on whether to uh, shelter in place uh, or evacuate may differ depending on uh, the type of event. Um, and so we've tried to focus on what are the right planning considerations and how do we communicate to the public. The national level exercise or NLE process in 2010 uh, actually focused on events related to uh, radiological emergencies, uh, including a September 2010 exercise that included state and local government uh, around the accidental release of radiation from a nuclear power plant. Um, and just uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the CDC convened, uh, after two years of planning, I might add, uh, a conference on preparedness for uh, radiological emergencies that involved 450 uh, state and local uh, radiological preparedness experts. Uh, and so even during the midst of uh, a response where uh, those folks and their technical expertise were needed at home, uh, they all assembled in Atlanta to discuss uh, our preparedness for this. Uh, and so again, that was planned uh, well in advance, which led us to ask our colleagues uh, what they were planning for two years from now, just so we could be ready. Um, but we've taken a number of steps to improve our preparedness for uh, a wide range of radiological emergencies, uh, but we will take a very close look at what's happening in Japan so that we learn even more. Absolutely. I think it would be, uh, for all of us, you know, who went through Katrina, it's always a, a difficult conversation to compare anything to Katrina. But the key there is that we want to make sure that our government learns from those mistakes. Do, do you feel today that we are better prepared as a result of Katrina, and can we become even higher, uh, again, an even higher level of preparedness as a result of what happened in Japan? Well, I, I don't want to make comparisons to specific events because they're each unique in their own way, um, but that really shows us why the focus on capabilities is what we believe is the most effective way to approach this, that if we build out certain core capabilities, we'll be able to respond to a wide range of incidents. And so uh, we know that um, based on guidance and planning and organizing training and equipment, uh, that local emergency managers, local public health, local law enforcement uh, can put those things together in ways that they need to, uh, to respond in the most flexible and agile way. Um, so I think this approach of focusing in on key capabilities, being very clear about the outcomes we're attending intending to achieve uh, will make us even more prepared. I'd like to take some questions now. Uh, as we're waiting for the microphone to be passed around, uh, please raise your hand if you'd like to ask the question. I'll look at my task force first. Uh, if anybody would like to uh, ask a question. So Marco, uh, before, uh, the microphone is back there. So Marco right here, Sorry, in the front row. I will say, uh, again, a special thanks to our task force members who have been working these issues, and we look forward to uh, putting out our first report very soon. So, Marco, please introduce yourself. Please. Marco Bourne, uh, Booz Allen Hamilton, and on the task force. Uh, Brian, pr applaud the administration for getting this out. I know it's been a long and uh, uh, difficult process, but certainly, hopefully, will prove to be a productive one. My question really revolves around measurement of preparedness. Mm -hmm. As part of the National Preparedness Report, that has to be done. Um, you have to base it on standards, mm -hmm. definitions of various levels of preparedness for mm -hmm. capabilities, et cetera, for planning. The challenge has always been agreement on what those measurements ought to be uh, across the federal government, state, and local government. Mm -hmm. What do you view as the next steps to achieve some discrete set of measurements um, that folks can actually agree to, buy into, and therefore apply resources for so they can be measured? Sure. Well, obviously, it's engagement of the stakeholders uh, with a focus on uh, what the key capabilities are. Uh, the CDC, for example, did that. Uh, if you go to cdc.gov, I'm sorry, I don't recall the exact page, 
uh, but you'll see the 15 uh, capabilities that working with their state lo uh, stakeholders at the state and local level, they said, you know, these really are um, the core things we need to uh, focus on in terms of building capability, uh, the ability to do medical surge, the ability to uh, distribute and dispense uh, medical countermeasures. Uh, it's a, uh, an engagement process with stakeholders, and so the implementation of the directive uh, is the next step. Uh, those consultations uh, in the development of uh, those measures uh, is where we go from here. Um, but it certainly uh, recognizes that we can't do it all here at the federal level. Uh, there are not federal solutions in terms of, um, you know, we identify for every community uh, what we think they need. Uh, they understand their risks. We need to focus on their understanding. Uh, and try and focus on the, the core capabilities and, and agree then how we measure those. Alan McCurry, front row here. I'll introduce Alan, former uh, Chief Operating Officer of the American Red Cross. Thank you. Um, and again, I, I'm listening for the words about NGOs in, in, uh, in the discussion, and they're critical. Uh, and, if, and I understand if you don't want to go to specific events, but when you take a look at of a disaster the size of Katrina, mm -hmm. uh, the only groups that can bring the number of people to help the displaced survivors are NGOs, whether it's my old organization, American Red Cross, Salvation Army, Catholic Charities, the list goes on and on. But it always has been, and I think it probably still is true, that the assumption is that the NGOs have the resources necessary to uh, short notice, implement care for large number of displaced people. Um, and that's not necessarily true because it's quite expensive for NGOs to warehouse um, materials large enough, not for a small family fire, it's not for a small tornado, not for a small flood, but for truly large numbers of displaced people. I think there's a flaw in any philosophy that believes NGOs are going to be ready to respond to a large uh, migration of people. Just interested on your thoughts on that. Uh, well, I mean, the key principle of all, all of nation obviously uh, includes um, the non-governmental organizations. Um, and as with, you know, planning with our state and local colleagues or with individuals and families, uh, I think it's only through kind of that sustained dialogue and experience working together as to understanding what the, uh, both the, the capabilities uh, in the nonprofit sector are, uh, what the challenges are, uh, what we might do to address those. Um, and so, again, without respect to any specific incident or assumptions you've described about what has been done in the past, I think we need to continue to evolve our approach uh, in terms of how we work together collaboratively. Uh, and so, um, <coughs> many federal departments and agencies uh, that are uh, on the front line of response um, engage the, uh, the nonprofit and the NGO community. Uh, we have seen it um, in all of the incidents uh, that we've experienced in this administration, uh, from the influenza pandemic to the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Uh, and so uh, we'll continue the dialogue so that we do understand what um, organizations can and cannot bring to the table so that we set realistic expectations uh, and that we, um, you know, don't make plans based on assumptions that won't come true because we haven't fully understood what the capabilities are. Uh, and so I take the point uh, that further understanding and collaboration are needed uh, and we'll aim to do even more. Great. And the next question, Don Lauren. Wait for the mic, I'll introduce you. Former uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, worked through the uh, National Response Framework with us. Uh, thank you, Brian. Don Lauren with the Tory Group, as Dan says, uh, former Administration Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Security Integration. Uh, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for all that you do, and thank you for continuing to move the ball up the field. Um, one of the, uh, the difficulties associated with much of the fine work you have done and the things you've talked about here is that even at the interagency level, as Dan and I would sit at the old DRG, inevitably the response you would get 
from many agencies when you would discuss the need for this type of preparedness and planning and uh, capability development uh, was, well, is that covered under the Stafford Act? Uh, how am I going to pay for that? Mm -hmm. I don't have the people to send off to training that's required to have uh, interoperable planning system and that sort of thing. So commensurate with many of these things in the new PDD, um, are we starting to concomitantly look at the resourcing and the leadership required to get everybody in alignment and able uh, to be able to, to execute this, this fine plan? Uh, well, the interagency has, as you know, Don, from your prior experience, and thank you for that, um, you know, very robust discussions of how to build those capabilities. We've encouraged uh, discussions that focus on uh, making the best and most effective use of the resources we have. Uh, I can't really speak to uh, ongoing budget uh, negotiations or specific requests, um, but obviously the, the discussions around constrained resources speak directly to um, the all of nation approach, and that is um, making sure that we've leveraged the resources that exist not just at the federal level not just at the state and local levels, who are similarly constrained in their resources, uh, but looking to the private sector, who does things like uh, supply chain management and logistics of movement of people and things very effectively. Uh, and so leveraging those resources as well, making them part of the community planning effort, um, the non-governmental organization community. And that's not um, with an intent to shift cost. Uh, that's with an intent to leverage those resources because those folks want to help. Um, they are members of that community. Uh, it is in their uh, personal and professional interests uh, to be um, actively engaged in the uh, response to and recovery from incidents at the community level. Uh, and so you're absolutely right. Uh, we need to continue to have robust discussions of um, how we improve our preparedness efforts, and that takes leadership conversation. Um, but I hope you'll agree with me that the president issuing a new uh, directive is uh, a clarion call in that leadership for improved preparedness. Next question is from a guy who epitomizes the bipartisan nature of Homeland Security. It's someone who was called into service post 9-11 as a Democratic congressman and then served in the Department of Defense, uh, Paul McHale. Uh, first of all, thank you for your service as a Marine, and then in the Bush administration, we have had many conversations about Hurricane Katrina, you and I, um, so I know that this is something you're passionate about. Um, Paul, former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense. Dan, good morning, and thank you for the kind words. Brian, good to see you again. Good to see you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, Brian, as I review PDD-8, it seems to, and your remarks I think corroborated this, seems to move away from the scenario-based planning of HSPD-8 Annex 1 toward capabilities-based planning. My question is, if we were to have a truly catastrophic event of the type that we had with Hurricane Katrina or in Fukushima today, mm -hmm. where the local community experiences comprehensive and dramatic damage, uh, where many public servants perhaps are the victims uh, or the or in this case, uh, a few of the survivors uh, of the original event. In light of that damage at the local level, for instance, in New Orleans, one-third of the police department uh, did not report to work after the event occurred. If you move to capabilities-based planning, where you've got an inventory of capabilities, in the aftermath of a truly catastrophic event mm -hmm. of the type envisioned by the 15 national planning scenarios, who would assemble these capabilities into a deployable force. And if you only have an inventory of capabilities rather than a scenario-based plan, would you, in the aftermath of such a crisis, be able to quickly assemble those capabilities in order to save the maximum number of lives? Sure. Uh, appreciate the question. Um, scenarios don't go away. Um, scenarios are still very useful to tease out requirements. Uh, but in the evolution of our uh, approach to planning, uh, we think starting with the core capabilities and how they're organized, which actually you can see reflected in the National Response Framework, for example, uh, of identifying the structures and processes uh, through which we bring those capabilities to bear in, in deployable um, ways. Um, we're going to continue to 
look at the NRF and the other planning processes that are necessary to make sure that they take account of uh, the capabilities and how um, you know those processes need to be brought to bear. Uh, but let me move away from that for a second. Um, the you know what we've seen throughout the incidents we've confronted uh, is that it really is the um, you know, the mixing and matching of capabilities at all level of government that provide us the most flexible and agile way to do things. Planning, as you know, um, uh, more than most in the room, incredibly useful in terms of building the relationship, identifying gaps, et cetera. Um, and I think it, I will borrow from, uh, I believe it was General Eisenhower that, you know, no plan survives first contact. Uh, and so what we're seeking to do uh, through use of scenarios to tease out requirements, through uh, co these conversations to identify the core capabilities that then allow us to have the, the more detailed operational level discussions, if you will, about, okay, now how are those brought to bear? Um, but we've um, gravitated away from, uh, and it's just an evolution in the approach. Um, because of what we've seen uh, in the incidents we've confronted, that we think the best way to approach this is through a uh, focus on those core capabilities and then have the frameworks in place to have the conversation about how, do they, how they apply. Other questions? Question down here. Before we do that, I'd like to acknowledge one person in the audience, Daryl Darnell. Daryl mm -hmm. worked on Brian's staff and probably helped a good part of this uh, throughout the process, and we were able to recruit Daryl here to GW months ago. We still feel the loss, but we know that the <laughs> students, faculty, staff, and visitors of the George Washington University are more safe uh, as a result. Question? I'm Steve Frankowitz from ITT Defense. Uh, I'd like to ask about an international aspect of uh, their policy. Obviously, if we have an avian flu breakout in uh, Asia, or perhaps a, a release of radioactivity of some measure in, in some uh, uh, foreign soil that could impact on the United States, what are the aspects of international uh, cooperation that are uh, embodied in this uh, PPD? Uh, the PPD largely focuses on the, the development of our domestic capabilities, um, but uh, certainly in events such as the H1N1 pandemic and the, the current situation, those capabilities can be brought to bear as needed uh, internationally. So we are working on our international collaboration and cooperation. Uh, and many U.S. government uh, agencies uh, are uh, on the ground uh, in Japan providing technical assistance. Uh, and so again, as we look to identify what resources and capabilities we need here, um, we're also looking to strengthen our international partnerships um, because, um, again, among the first incidents that the administration confronted was the influenza pandemic, which, uh, as you know, Steve, was a global event uh, day one. Uh, and so uh, our conversations about what our capability was to develop vaccine and antiviral uh, in a uh, quick manner uh, was immediately a global conversation. Um, our experience there uh, led the president to propose a medical countermeasure initiative that he first introduced uh, in the 2010 State of the Union address that focuses on how we uh, more rapidly and reliably develop medical countermeasures. Uh, and um, we've made a number of proposals um, pursuant to that initiative. Uh, to remove the bottlenecks in the development uh, process for medical countermeasures. But that's the example of the kind of capability that, while it may start domestically, um, the threats uh, we face and some of the incidences we've already experienced are truly global in nature. Uh, and so a longer answer perhaps than you wanted uh, to a short question uh, about how we see this affecting our international collaboration and cooperation but we believe focusing on the development of our domestic capabilities uh, while in tandem we continue to enhance our international collaboration and partnership uh, is the right approach. Other questions? Well, as a, as a firefighter paramedic, I care about how these issues impact state and local officials. Mm -hmm. you know, we can talk about policy here in Washington, but where the rubber meets the road are really uh, those on the front lines, yep. uh, our nation's first responders. I'll ask a question unless uh, Happy to turn to, we have plenty of fire chiefs here. I'm just looking for them to uh, help you out. Adam. 
Adam Thiel is a member of our uh, steering committee here at HSPI, and he's a member of our task force. But his day job is uh, fire chief of the city of Alexandria. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Brian, for coming. Uh, I guess in that vein, how does this policy acknowledge the fact that local first responders are always going to be the first to deal with disasters and emergency incidents uh, within the broader concept of federalism? Well, the, I mean, the, the capability development and the conversations to understand um, what is possible and what is needed at the local level um, certainly acknowledges our federal system. I mean, this presidential directive obviously does nothing to change that. Uh, and so the national response framework and its relationship in terms of uh, roles and responsibilities, uh, we will continually evaluate. Uh, but there's no change here to the recognition that um, locals will always be on the front lines. Um, but we do think that a, a renewed emphasis on a principle such as the all of nation approach uh, and a renewed emphasis on individual and community preparedness uh, actually aims toward um, bringing individuals and families uh, more into the uh, preparedness equation such that it might actually reduce uh, the uh, burden on local response. And by that, I mean if uh, those who can prepare do, um, the needs on uh, public response systems, um, you know, should uh, reduce accordingly. Uh, and so the PPD recognizes that there are respective roles in the federalist system, does not change that, um, but it also recognizes we, we truly do need to understand uh, from our uh, state and local colleagues' perspectives what are the risks they face and how do we help them most effectively build the capabilities um, with that understanding in mind. Other questions? We've talked, uh, I guess, about federal government, state, local government, NGOs. Seems like the private sector is up, right? Anybody from the private sector want to ask a question? <laughs> okay, I will just ask the open-ended question. <laughs> How does the private sector fit into this? Uh, well, I mean, first and foremost, the private sector are members of their community. Uh, and we see that, and we recognize that they have uh, the same interests we do in uh, withstanding events, uh, recovering uh, rapidly, uh, and adapting to change. Uh, and I think it's an area that we have great opportunity to understand even more uh, what can be brought to bear. Uh, and so the example I gave, uh, and it's one of many, uh, where Craig Fugate has a rotation program for executives to come into an operations center, because it's, you know, it's, it's a language issue. Um, the private sector may not fully appreciate, um, and, and it's an observation, it's not a criticism, may not fully appreciate what, what goes on in an operations center, what are the types of questions that government is asking, what are the immediate actions that the government is attempting to take, and how could the private sector's expertise assist in that effort? Uh, on the other side of that equation, um, we may be attempting in government operation centers to recreate functions um, that we have neither the expertise nor time to deliver and that exist in the private sector and are available for, you know, the discussion to understand what is there. Uh, and so we believe the private sector are members of the community. They have an interest in protecting their employees. They live there. Um, and we think there are resources there that uh, bear further exploration and conversation. Uh, and so we think it's an area for uh, great opportunity for advancement. Uh, and so we'll continue those dialogues. My last question will be on next steps. My mm -hmm. assumption is that this is beginning rather than the end. In other words, there's a lot of uh, directives uh, in this directive uh, that will have to be carried out by departments and agencies and likely through interagency processes. Can you describe how that will occur? Uh, absolutely. We move into an implementation phase, but as I already mentioned, uh, because the uh, conversation with the interagency with our stakeholders uh, really did shine a light on some key principles, departments and agencies have already moved out uh, according to some of these principles uh, in developing uh, some key capabilities around certain disciplines, uh, in engaging uh, the private sector and engaging individuals and families more. Um, that's not to say there is not, uh, you know, good deal of additional effort that is now required, 
uh, to implement uh, the president's direction. Uh, but the best news is that uh, departments and agencies did not wait um, because these principles were uh, important to them as well. Um, they've started to take action already. Uh, and so we will move into the implementation phase with departments and agencies and the further outreach to our uh, state and local uh, colleagues and individuals and families uh, to enhance our national preparedness. Ryan, let me present this token of our appreciation, the HSPI coin. Oh, great. <laughs> and you. thank you for uh, being here today, Brian. Oh, thank you Appreciate very much. It. Thanks, all.